Hello and welcome back to the Gamification Report, episode 18. Today we're going to dig a little deeper into gamification and what we would call serious games rather than serious educational games and look at three very hot topics, racism in gamification, sexism in gamification, and gamified harassment is something I think I want you to understand. There is a code of ethics within the gamification guru community that we're beginning to craft about what you can use game principles for and what you shouldn't use them for. We know we have reports coming out of China now that they're starting to use a reporting app so that you can identify citizens and report to the government whether they're doing uh, government positive things or whether they're an agitator. They're, 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 some of these reports are starting to come in. And then we have uh, folks we're going to talk about in what the dark net today who use uh, gamified uh, techniques uh, to create harassment and to attack individuals on social media. So we want to talk about some of these hot topics today. Uh, it's triggery stuff, but we've got to face it at some point and look at the power of games to produce social transformation if we harness them correctly. We're going to start off by looking at gamification and, and, and racism. And this is an interesting paper by Jose Alvarez uh, Bermejo and his group in 2016. And he's in Spain and he's looking at the shifting demographics in Spain. And what you'll see is that over, uh, as occurring in many European and, and North American companies, is that there's higher rates of immigration. Uh, so here we have the Spanish population in 1998 to 2015 showing a very slow decline. And then we have a foreign population showing a much faster exponential rate of decline. Now, your Xenon xenophobic uh, haters are going to be in this segment here. These are people that are going to dislike this is going on. They want to preserve Spain as it always has been. And as we'll see in the gamified approach, it's not always a conscious decision. A good deal of racism is through to unconscious bias. Uh, but we all know by looking at this flat curve for the Spanish population that this is a flat population curve and this is deadly for a country economically. Uh, if you don't have more people coming into your country to buy goods and services, you don't see growth and eventually your death overtakes your birth rate now that people are having fewer children. So we have in Canada, we need to admit, for example, over a quarter million immigrants a year into Canada. Many of m m might be refugees, etc. Many are going through standard immigration process in order to maintain a healthy economy. So this xenophobic approach it becomes an unconscious bias and we want to be able to address this because we are seeing a trend in some parts of the world toward a new xenophobia, anti-immigration and anti uh, and, and sort of racist policies. So this idea that, that, that Alvarez sets up is this detection of racial-based bullying. So he develops a game and an app system in which he looks looks at different categories. So for example, the way we might describe another, suppose we have uh, somebody who is coming from another country, they might feel in their dialogue, what goes on in their head as they're in the classroom, that they don't respect, they're not respected, people don't know them, they think them stupid, uh, I frighten them, they think, uh, now you might have someone in the class thinking they think the class is theirs, the playground is theirs, they stare at me. It's these perceptions, this kind of unconscious things that occur as we enter this kind of space here of otherness. And then there's this knowledge in the game that he tried to build in as what separates us. So for example, they don't trust me, we don't have any money, they say that we smell bad, we're going to do something to them. Uh, the way immigrants often feel that they're kind of treated as another. So the game was able to track those statements and you were able to, to place those statements in the app. So the information had to, that was collected here had to be identifying distrust of nationality or identifying causes of discrimination. And the settings might be coexistence in the classroom in this case, or they might be a setting outside the classroom. So he has an app which is gathering this data based on this going here. So this is a user-centered design with an app. The application pursued a combination of face-to-face -face and virtual interaction among students with supervision and involvement of the teacher to detect anomalous behavior. So it was able to record the interaction among the students to be able to even tape it and analyze it and classify it. So we're kind of getting a real-time window into how people are relating to the other in any given situation, whether the other is ageist, racist, homophobic, whatever. So the app essentially shows augmented reality scenarios that have to do with data that you're gathering about your reactions to otherness. Uh, very fascinating. We have a loading screen that we show here that assigns an ID. These are all anonymous. So as you play the game, it's complete anonymity. You can say whatever you want. You can express whatever you like and react how you wish. And the game is going to manage that for you in its database. It can track points through uh, using uh, augmented reality simulations, such as selecting a baseball team. So in selecting a baseball team, uh, you would say, are you picking the immigrants uh, last or are you going to pick them first for your team? There's various activities in which we uncover uh, activities which are, are racist or homophobic and we don't know it. 
is simply built into unconscious biasing or systematic discrimination. And so out of this, the game was able, the, the app was able to construct a series of sociograms, which talked about how the agents interacted with each other and how these behaviors impacted with each other. Fascinating work that was done here. Now, the observations were very interesting in the course of this. They, when they looked at their data, four out of five classrooms had foreign students that were sitting in the back rows. Foreign students didn't sit in the front row. They never wanted to be the object of attention. They wanted to hide to fit in. That in itself came out of the game, and that's fascinating. We might never pick that up using standard analytics. Now, even though they had descriptive analysis of data collected from different schools, most of the students preferred to work or share a table with a native classmate, 72% of the sample. So you would rather have someone Spanish working with you on an assignment than someone who's an immigrant. Um, distrust, however, was able to be untangled from that and not associated to any greater extent with foreign students. So basically, 60% of the sample say they trusted a classmate of whatever nationality. So there's still uh, too many, but it's not associated linearly with the idea of sharing space with an immigrant. With respect to a coexistence outside the classroom, um, they didn't see racial stigma in sports. They, for example, only found that 20% of the sample say they would not invite an immigrant classmate for a baseball team. So when it came to sports, people were, allowed, were a little freer with how they saw the other. When organizing non-sport activities like a birthday party, the percentage of rejection rises slightly to 24%. Um, 64% of the sample said they might not invite any classmate. They might dislike everyone in their class. But the idea is that that's a relatively low. So in fact, working together caused more distrust than playing together. Maybe because more is on the line when you're working together. And this is where you don't want to trust your fate to another. Finally, outside of the classroom and matters leading to closer involvement, such as going on vacation, the majority of students preferred to go with for, for, uh, foreign students. So in fact, there was a positive effect when we looked outside the classroom uh, using the app that people like the idea when they're traveling to go with someone from another place that might help them show them around or uh, might uh, be an adventure companion. Very interesting. It's 56%, but it's still noteworthy. Isn't it interesting how using gamified apps and allowing people to input data in augmented situations g allows us to dissect where my microbiases are occurring. So it's not just pointing a finger and saying you're a racist. You might be racist in some activities, but other activities race blind. And this would allow us to focus on these race activities, these isms, and to give more targeted training. And we know with Starbucks and other major companies now are very interested in anti-bias training. These kind of games can be very powerful and we want to look at them. I think then we want to look at a little bit more at something a little more devious here. And this is, I'm going to call where misogyny dwells. And this is a paper produced by Alice Marwick and Robin Kaplan in 2018. And this is something that's going to be a little disturbing for some of you. You might want to turn the broadcast off now, but I would keep it on to do a little bit of learning. And how uh, the uh, sort of the dark world of, of gamified principles is coming to play and how we might try to prevent it. There's something called the Manosphere. Now, the Manosphere is a series of network blogs, podcasts, and forums that create harassment online. Uh, for example, there's a guy named Carl who profits from harassing women. He makes 5000 a month on a site called Patreon for creating YouTube videos that mock, insult, or discredit women online, and he's not alone. There are many YouTubers who profit from a cottage industry of online harassment and anti-feminism. And this is a dark. This is something no one's going to admit to you in face-to-face. -face. This is what we may call almost dark web. But there are people here that feel uh, in, in this group, in the manosphere, that men are getting a bad shake, uh, that blacks and women's are taking the job. Uh, real Archie Bunker types, and, and they're quiet about it, but they're not so quiet online. There's a whole uh, effort that's highly associated sometimes with uh, populism and, and, and sort of extreme political movements. Now, this all began, our awareness of this begins in Gamergate. Now, Gamergate occur occurred a few years ago. Uh, this is where uh, these Manosphere uh, bloggers began to target Zoe Quinn and Brianna Wu. They're both game developers, and they also went after a social media critic Anita Sarkeesian. And uh, what they did is they uh, threatened them with rape, and uh, they threatened them with death threats um, uh, and, and doxing. And, and we'll talk about doxing. Doxing is spreading negative information about someone on the internet. They used a number of techniques to use this. They used 4chan, Internet Relay chat Twitter and Reddit to do it. So again, you don't have just one person who's a bit of a nut threatening you. You may have 15 or 20 guys that have made a deal online to go after you. And we'll talk about the ways they go after you using these gamified principles. Um, uh, this is Zoe Quinn, a Wikipedia photo. She's a game designer, and they went after her because uh, women should not be designing games, uh, in their view. And uh, we see this alt-right backlash of Jordan Peterson and populism and anti-feminism and pushback on the Me Too movement. Uh, this is Sarkeesian here on, on this side of the screen. So uh, again, we're not talking about your political views. Those would be your own to hold. But the extreme uh, position here, uh, headed off by scholars such as Jordan Peterson, is kind of a, a, a anti-feminist or kind of a taking back the street 
uh, to get the white guy back to where he belongs in society. That's the underlying language here. We're not trying to probe the political issues, but the languaging of how they use gamified approaches to make their attack. So Anita Sarkeesian um, comments that we don't usually think of online harassment as a social activity, but we do know from strategies and tactics that they use that they were not working alone. They were loosely coordinating with one another. That the social component is a motivating factor that works to provide incentives because you get online and because other people can read it, you can escalate attacks because people might like your post. You might put up a post that you hated a particular candidate or hated a particular person. Other people might hit likes and then that social element can snowball, especially if a few likes are picked by, uh, as it were, uh, sleepers, people that are out there that are automatically going to like the post you put up discrediting someone and then that begins a fall of everyone kind of feels a social pressure to add likes. And we see this occurring in the United States right now where there's a, a real schism of uh, political ideologies. Um, so this is Anita Sarkeesian. So this is the idea of misandry. And this is when men's rights groups attacking feminism. And they use these gamified strategies, which we talked about, are coordinated network attacks. Uh, Anti-Semitic and anti-Islamic ideas were generated during Gamergate as well. Uh, it certainly wasn't restricted to attack on women. They were going after Jews and Muslims, etc. And this is, again, the idea that the white male is under assault from people of color. And it's a fully gamified internet voice and ideological system. Jonathan Bishop looks at the gamified harassment methods that are now in use as of 2017. And this is what's called a trolling magnitude uh, chart. And what we do if we look down here, these are trolling. So what trolling is, uh, let me just go back <laughs> a little. We're getting excited here. Actually, I'm working a... Uh, a Mac mouse, and I'm a PC guy, so these mice have a will of their own, little mice. So this is trolling magnitude as we begin to explore it. One to four, these are increasing trolling. So trolling is making comments on the internet that are negative or are, are discour disparaging. And they, they classify them into different activities we won't talk about in detail of seduction gravity, trolling intensity, befriending mode, kudos motive, and descriptions. So for example, a, a trolling magnitude one is in a moment with regret. So you might uh, make one comment about a political and say, well, she's so-and-so, or she's a, a this or a that. And then you would have regret. You were kind of an idiot. And if you can do it, you'll try to remove it, uh, sort of edit and delete your comment. But that's a level one trolling magnitude. Uh, and then you go to a level two, and these become in a moment, but no regret. So you might really, really hate people with green hair, and you're going to go crazy on them. And you don't have any regret, because this is a chance to, to get your thoughts out about those terrible green-haired people. And then you start to move into the more dangerous and insidious parts of the net, which are magnitude three and four gamified attacks. And this is called cyberbullying and cyber hickory. So this is talking for what are called lols. LOL means laughing out loud. Lols are attacking someone in a specific. So what they actually do is they cause a problem. They wake up in the morning and they say, how can I go after this person? And they create it. And that's what's called lol stalking. And then finally you move to these explicit seduction gravities, which are trolling magnitude four, cyber hickory. That's a plan. So that's where you might have five or 10 friends who are all going to coordinate Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn attacks uh, against a specific person. Believe me, this is actually played out. Uh, I was as shocked as you might be in knowing that this is the level of gamified uh, uh, sophistication we've reached. So the key gamified elements that start to happen have to do with doxing and do doxing double X. Doxing is posting documents and personal information within the law. So if you're a public uh, speaker or public figure like a politician or a, uh, a policeman, then you could post personal information to say, this policeman, we saw them smoking a joint. And, you know, it might not be true, but the point is you're posting it. Here they are, I'm smoking it. And you create these, these kinds of these kinds kinds of uh, kind of uh, um, uh, th uh, threads. Uh, they, they really become a thread. Now, doxing is doing the same, but it's outside the law. And in order to dox, you have to start entering hacking. And so we're seeing what's called packet sniffing occur. Now, that is tracking your own personal information by hacking using emails, passwords, and credit card data. It breaks to Wi-Fi security and intercepts data. And generally, this is how a packet sniffing attack occurs. You have a Wi-Fi writer in your PC, and the sniffer intercepts the internet traffic, and it creates all of this background. And so this is where they see uh, that they might find uh, photographs of you naked on cloud that you did 10 years ago when you were drunk and silly and then put them right up on the internet for all to see. So this is what packet sniffing, this is high level trolling and these are the gamified attacks that are used. Um, you can of course block these through encryption and uh, we don't have the time to go through all of this but you can do a lot of encryption in terms of, of keeping these uh, packet sniffers out of your hard drive. That's it for this week, debating the undebatable. How do we address racism, sexism and downright hatred? Uh, uh, by using gamified principles? And how do we block gamified attacks? These are kinds of things we have to consider in this world we live in. I hope you have a beautiful, peaceful, and accepting and loving week. From all of us here at Humber College Center for Teaching and Learning, I'm David Chandros. We'll see you on the flip side.